Well, it was interesting. I received a uh, email the other day, and you know, I unfortunately get dozens of emails a week or, or more, and I just don't have time to respond to them. I really appreciate all the emails that everyone sends, and it was about mock scrapes and how I should do a video about a mock scrape, and if it doesn't work, you just move it. You know, what do you do? And so it, it brought up quite a few fixes. Uh, for mock scrape fails and, and and what I see is a recurring theme when I go to a client property uh, for example rope uh, Rope will work just a percentage just a fraction of what like a natural vine would work say a jack pine branch up north a beech branch a white oak branch uh, natural licking or uh, rub branches uh, tree species that deer will use regularly uh, work several times better and so i'll go to a client property as a rope it's a fad a ribbon i've seen all kinds of stuff that people use and and that's one of the things i see right away they're using unnatural material um, even scrapes hung from cables going across it just it's not that natural compared to and that's when i use do use a rope is when i hang that you can see we have a small rope attached up here it's about four or five inches of rope coming down it's just attached to that branch so fail number one using unnatural materials for the actual, actual lip, licking branch. Number two, this is in, there's a trail going downhill right here that where deer come up. Um, they actually come at a side angle, then come up too. We have a trail easily, you can see going this way. This is the main trail, this is a rut cruising trail. And then they go out to the fields this way. So this is that X of movement. Literally, if a deer walks through here, especially a big buck, he's almost gonna have to hit his head on the mock scrape, not to use it. Is so what, why do you need to do that? Well, it's not just defining the movement right here. We're not trying to take movement and add a mock scrape and say, because of this mock scrape, we're gonna attract deer to this location. We're putting in a mock scrape where we already have an intersections of trails where we think we can shoot them from and kill those deer, hang a camera on it, and let us know that the mature bucks use this spot. For example, this mock scrape, when we put it here, it's in this movement, it's already in a movement pattern. We had bucks hitting in this within 24 hours and almost all of the mock scrapes that I put in, if we wait a week, something's going on, something's wrong. They should be hit right away, whether it's does, fawns, young bucks, big bucks, old bucks, doesn't really matter. They're used right away. But part of that's because we're using natural materials and it's right in the middle of a trail system where we can expect to shoot them from. We have a really nice big oak up there where we're gonna have a tree stand. See, it's already cleared out. We cleared it out quite a while ago, a few weeks ago, so that we can put a stand there, get a shot right into here, and then we can shoot all the way along this trail too. So great spot where you can expect to shoot them from. We have good access to get in there. We're gonna have hidden access getting into that tree. We're looking in their window right here. And in fact, after this video, we're getting out of here until we're actually hunting this. Uh, when I hunt that stand will be the next time that I change that camera and we'll see what's, what's on it then. But we've been getting big buck pictures here the entire time. Now we have that natural, and a convergence of trails. Again, you're not trying to stick it in an area where you're expecting to move deer to. This isn't a water hole. And even then I put it on a trail system or a natural movement. It's not a bait pile. I have a lot of people say Michigan hunters that were used to baiting for many, many years or decades. They'll throw a mock scrape out like it's a bait pile. Deer are gonna come across the swamps from a mile away to hit that mock scrape. That's not how it works. This is a part of a natural movement. You're just helping to define movement. There might be two trails that way, two trails that way. I want them to hit this trail and hit it the highest percentage of time. It's a movement through here already. And there's not just gonna be this trail, but when you put this mock scrape here, it becomes the trail that they use. Another point, you can see this is about waist high, belly high, right here. This is elevation. I want every doe and fawn that comes through here to leave their scent on this. So many people think about this. They think about a buck actually pawing and making the scrape down there. We clear that out to a three or four foot diameter. That's critical. We get rid of all the vegetation on here. We want this to look natural. This is a calling card deer. This is a huge dirt area. And that's where we make them all. They can see that from 20 yards away. They can smell it. So when this is open, great. It's a calling card right now, but bucks are only making the scrape and acting like that raging bull during the rut, during the secondary rut, maybe a little bit during January in a third rut. But they're only making that scraping activity at very specific times of year. The rest of the year though, 365, seven, they'll leave their scent on this vine right here. They'll leave their preorbital gland scent. So they come in, they rub it. When you have it in the middle of the trail, when you're using natural materials, when you're using a hanging vine, they're not going out of their way to hit a branch off to the side that, they'd only, that they only paw up and make that scrape 
around or utilize and actually scrape it during the rut. This is something they use all around. A little bit different. I don't even, you'd even call it a hybrid scrape. It's, it's a little bit different type of scrape than deer usually use. And the reason I started using this is because back in the 80s, some of the best scrapes that I saw was in a tangle. They were in a tangle of grapevines on the Oak Knoll back by its Clarkston area. Used some private land that we used to hunt, but it was Independence Oaks County Park near that location, M15, Sashaba, if you guys are familiar with that area. It used to be at Pineapp Ski Hill, Pineapp Recreation Area, um, near those areas. But uh, the first year I saw this, probably back in 1985, 86, and really didn't understand what it was other than someone told me that's where bucks are. And that was about it. But then I started seeing that over and over again when I'm on private lands, some of the best perennial licking branches and scrapes are vines that are hanging down. We had some great pictures back in the early 2000s, vines that we had on, um, the property we hunted in, in Coon Valley in Wisconsin. And to this day, the best scrape that I could find, vertical. And I believe it's because more can participate in the scraping process. Now, the actual licking branch itself, whether you're using jack pine, white oak, a vine, if you're using aspen, popple, or um, a tag alder, great trees that bucks like to rub, but they're a little bit lighter material and they don't last as long. You just plan on replacing them every year. I like about a five foot piece, three quarter inch to one inch in diameter. You want enough weight that they can actually rub their pre orbital gland on scent. You don't want to blow it in the wind like a ribbon. Pretty cool if you stick a ribbon out there and you show a buck coming in and making a scrape. Well, we're talking like the 99% club with something like this, not the one or 2% kind of fad type thing or, or gimmick. Uh, same with rope. Um, there's so many ropes out there that they won't hit because of the resin or glue that they use in that rope that's not natural. But even then, a rope hanging down is not natural. It still can blow around in the wind. So this is something more that a buck will find anywhere around here. We're taking this material from here and I encourage you to use that material. So make sure that's the right height. We don't want it up here. More of a traditional licking branch comes out the side just like this right here. So that would come over here right by where Dylan's at and push him out of the way. And that buck would work this area right here and then he could work his antlers into this right here and, and make that scrape. So that's more he's pushing on that. He wants that resistance. He rubs his preorbital gland sense on it and, and then he makes that scrape down here. So that's different. It's off to the side. Not every deer is participating in it. I want fawns to use this too. We have video of dancing fawns around it, I call it. On Google. If you just look up dancing fawns at Mock Scrape on YouTube, you'll find it. But uh, they're jumping all around, getting excited. Can you imagine all the scent that they could smell on that? And they're only a couple months old. It's in July, early July, and they, they wouldn't even understand what it is. Another aspect of this, this is a flat area. This is flat right here. This represents that dish, a movement. We flattened it down. We actually took soil from this upper side made this into a flat area. This branch right here, you can see it starting to go downhill. I see people that'll put scrapes on the side of a hill and you can't have that runoff. You can't have that slope to it. I had a really cool looking scrape back in the day that was a hoop scrape, used it several years ago, many years ago, 10 years ago. And it, and it was just a little bit on a grade right there, thought it would work and it, and it wasn't touched. You move 10 yards over, put it on a flat like that and they touch it. So has to be flat, has to be in a trail, has to be the right height, the right material. And you can bet we're gonna have a tree stand right by every one of our mock scrapes. We're not just putting one randomly in the location. And that's another factor too. I've literally, I've, I see this, say this all the time, I've literally seen 500 scrapes in one 200 acre parcel, just ridiculous. It used to be the thought that you have more scrapes, you have more bucks. No, it just meant that the value of the one scrape was one 500th. It was very low value. I want deer to come to this spot in front of that stand. You're not managing their time more by putting a bunch of scrapes. If that was the case, they could bet over there and 100 yards away and they have 20 scrapes on the way here from there and they never make it to your stand because they're busy working 20 scrapes. That's not how it works. You use a scrape to define movement. I recommend about one scrape per every stand location. If you have, I've seen 50 down on a two track where again, the thought we'll have more scrapes, we'll have more bucks. And then they walk down the tree track to get to their stands and three, if the bucks were there, they just left their scent, spooked the deer, ruined their property because of that row of scrapes. I want one per stand. Water holes are a little bit different. Uh, 40 acre parcel, you might get away with two to three if it's really dry, maybe some elevation change, otherwise one to two. 80 acre parcel, you might get away with three to four. Maybe on a 500 acre parcel, you get away with six to eight, something like that, maybe 10 at the most. But again, you put 10 water holes on one 40 acre parcel, the value of each one 
is drastically reduced and you lose your ability to find movement with the water holes, let alone the scrape. About one per stand seems to be about right. And you can bet we'll always have a trail camera on it. You know what's cool about this mock scrape, this trail camera? Deer do not look at this, this uh, trail camera. It's right up here. It's about six and a half feet tall, six and a half. They come in paying attention to that licking branch right behind Dylan and they, pay, they don't pay attention to the stand. They don't pay attention to the trail camera. And so I really encourage you, you know, for Diane, this is her first year hunting with a vertical bow. And I can't wait for her to hunt these stands and have a buck coming in facing right at a mock scrape. We're being very diligent about that with all our stand locations, especially with Diane hunting, because I want her to be able to pull off that shot. And, uh, and hey, if those bucks are focusing on that right there, instead of this or that, or even does coming through, less likely that she's going to spook them in the stand as an inexperienced hunter uh, trying to get a, her first shot with a vertical bow. Again, those are some reasons why I'm seeing that mock scrapes are not working. If you follow these principles, you're putting them in a deer trail, you're going to pull deer in to this location instead of traveling by the area. It's not like you're attracting them from the other property. You're not gonna have all these scrapes and manage your time. They'll always stay on your property because you have so many scrapes to work. What you're going to do is define movement, set them up for a stand location, set them up for a trail camera shot, use all natural materials. Yeah, we tie them in with rope right up there. I encourage you to have at least a five foot vine. It's okay to have a branch coming down like this. If we use uh, branches that are 15 feet in the air, there's sometimes I'm literally standing on the rail of my pickup truck, leaning against the cab and tying it about 10 feet, chest level, somewhere in that range. Um, standing at the top of the step ladder we used to do, I don't encourage you to do that. But um, those are some principles that you need and in ingredients for a mock scrape to make sure that it works every single time. And last but not least, could have included this first. Imagine dozens of deer, box does, fawns, that come and leave their pre orbital gland scent on the licking branch, this vertical licking branch. They're leaving it on this because it's in the right location. We've made the flat surface, it's natural material. It's not off to the side, it's within their movement, but they're leaving their scent on this because we haven't used some unnatural man-made commercial scent that we've sprayed all over this could potentially cover up this mock scrape and this licking branch and cover up all that goodness of the preorbital gland scent and all that scent and that natural scent that's left here. I'm not going to pretend that I've tried every natural scent out there. In fact, I haven't used scent since the late 80s, about 1986, 85, right around there, when I shouldn't have bought that natural or man-made urine or bottled urine, whatever it was, because it was too much and I spent too much money for it. And I think I've told the story before, I put a little bit out, you know, I'm hunting, I was hunting Pontiac Lake Recreation Area back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, of course you don't see any bucks, you're, you're full of hope. I'm thinking I put that out there and bucks are gonna come running, put a little more, a little more. And then I had that, I still remember that feeling of incredible guilt that I just spent $14 for a bottle of urine or whatever it was, and it was gone. I used it all. Instead of a couple drops here and there like they recommended, I used the whole bottle. I'm not saying that there's not a man-made scent out there that's better than dozens of natural deer scent that are left here by pre orbital gland scent. I haven't tried them all. But I can tell you that we have bucks hitting these setups within a day. I get those reports all over the country of when people do it right, it works. And hey, maybe there's a great scent out there that somebody could use, but I don't see how it could be any better than the luck and the use and the experience for many years that I have going back in the mid 2000s using no scent. And finally, we start our scrapes, you know, once this is started, we pee into it sometimes. I think I peed into this once. Maybe I didn't, maybe I did. I don't remember, I don't do it all with all of them. But once it gets going and we have all the scent right here, we let nature take over, let the deer take over, and I hope that makes sense. A lot of times when I go over it, someone asks, well, why is my scrape not working? Well, there's about 10 reasons right there that it might not be working. But if you're following all those steps, when I put a scrape in like this, I had no doubt that it'd be used in a couple of days. And we've been handsomely rewarded with just an overwhelming number of box does and fawns that hit this scrape throughout the weeks. And I hope you've enjoyed some of the footage from this spot right here. And we've changed the card. I know there's good batteries in here. We're gonna hunt that as one of our early season sets because we can get in and out of here without spooking deer. You can see all this goldenrod ragweed. We exit, we enter the stand from back there. A buck would have to be, literally be right here for us to spook them getting in that stand. So this might be 
I'm pretty sure actually, depending on the winds, will be one of our um, early season stands. And uh, hopefully we'll get Diane shooting a big buck out of this. I'll, I'd like to shoot a big buck too, but I've shot enough and it's fun for me. I might be filming her if she'll let me. She wants Dylan to film her or Dante, her son, instead of me. So <laughs> we'll see about that. But we're gonna get out of here now. We'll be back when we hunt and I can't wait to show you to you guys. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, you're obviously interested in white tail habitat solutions, what I have to teach, and you will love my new web class series. The first one is how to design your white tail property. It's out now. The link is in the description. I invite you to check it out. It's on my website. Can't wait to hear about it.